This is Coastal Magazine. This is Sandra's publication, which is online only now. Yeah. Which is at, what's the website? www.coastermag.com. Coastermag.com. Yeah. And I noticed in the, the first issue, there's an editor's letter uh, as an introduction, which talks about um, Hong Kong waking up to the beer scene. And I was a bit confused by that. And what did you mean by Hong Kong has finally sort of fallen in love with beer? Mm -hmm. Because Beer's, beer's been around, but you're saying there's something else that was missing and it's come back. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. finally here. Mm -hmm. um, right, so I'm just throwing out the numbers again. Uh, when I came back to Hong Kong in 2015, there were maybe only two local breweries, local craft breweries um, in existence. And then um, the numbers just steadily started growing since then. So uh, when I wrote that issue, this was in 2016. Uh, we were at around 20 breweries, so that number sort of exponentially gone up, and now we're pushing 35 local breweries in Hong Kong. And for such a small city, I mean, that's pretty incredible, the growth. Uh, for a while there, we were a bit behind Singapore. Um, Singapore was actually faster than us in terms of like people falling in love with craft beer and starting their own breweries, but I think um, there are just more red tape in Singapore. It's a bit harder to set up your brewery. Property prices are also really high. Okay. Um, I mean, it's high in Hong Kong too, but so we've kind of eclipsed them. So I think um, for us, two, pe uh, two people set up, which was what um, Munson Brewery started out as, one of the local breweries. They, we call them a nano brewery because they were tiny. Um, their old brewery, so their very initial brewery was only 700 square feet. So it was in this tiny little kitchen. I don't know if you can see the photo. Do you mean to do oh it? <laughs> mm. So that small one at the bottom in the kitchen, that was their first location. And it was only 700 square feet, which is like, you know, 70 square meters, right? It's so, it was so small. How much beer are we talking production-wise when it comes to a narrow, nano brewery? Um, let me see. So they were doing eight 100 liter fermenter tanks. And now they're doing five 1,000 liter tanks so you know it's like 10 times more now they, they really moved to a bigger space and do you do you find the craft breweries that are here are they are they chinese staff or are they expats coming to set up here um the push was definitely by expats i think um hong kong's a very transient city so we have a lot of um, foreigners coming in and coming out and those who decide to stay longer and who love beer end up maybe trying out home brewing first and then from home brewing they start moving on and considering renting a space and doing something which is what uh, Laszlo and Michelle from Moons and Brewery were doing. So they both had full-time jobs but then they were home brewing on the side and then they started bottling and people were trying them and they really liked it. So it sort of transitioned from that. That's how traditionally, I mean <laughs> traditionally, it's only been five years, <laughs> that's how it started for most of the breweries here. But now we're getting more and more locals uh, involved Definitely. No one's ever said that to okay. me. So usually, as long as it's brewed in Hong Kong and you know the people call Hong Kong home, then they'd consider it like a local craft beer. Yeah, we're not we're not elitists. We we don't want to. We want to be more um, inviting to people who mm. want to try new beers. We're not going to be like. But isn't there a sense of pride from any country if mm -hmm. that country has people of their of the. Native to that population, making uh -huh. something that they can be, that can represent that part of the world. Maybe there are people who are like this, but not anyone I've encountered. I think we try to be more inclusive in the community, so we don't want to be like strictly, oh, because this is run by two people from the UK, it's not considered local craft beer. I mean, it's not like that at all, so. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, no, I've never encountered anyone who's been like, I only drink beer made by Chinese people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then even uh, Tsing Tao mm -hmm. is run by a German, it's bought by a German company, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So is, is that authentically Chinese? The great yeah. thing about Periscope is you can just scroll up now in the comments. Do you publish any of your beer recipes in your magazine? And what's the best IPA? Oh, I answered that IPA one. But oh. um, so for beer recipes, we have a section called uh, Brew IY where we get a contributor. Usually it's um, one of the guys from HK Brewcraft, which is a local home brewing store. Um, Chris is also a BJCP judge, and I think he's a certified Cicerone as well. So mm. he home brews quite a bit, and he puts his recipes in so as a contributor. But I don't home brew myself. 
because I have no patience. <laughs> so, and I don't have fridge space. So, and in Hong Kong, you know, tiny apartments mm. and the heat. So I can't. You're the president, and some people are, are going to be like, hang on, but you're a woman. <laughs> Women can't be presidents. Uh, do you want to explain how you, this came to be? Right. And well, number one, women can totally be presidents. But uh, okay, so the Craft Beer Association, <laughs> the Craft Beer Association in Hong Kong was founded in 2013. Uh, I think late 2013. So we've been around for about five years. Uh, when I came back to Hong Kong from Germany in 2015, I joined a craft beer importer and distribution company. So that was when I joined as a corporate member for the association. And then, yeah, I just we had monthly corporate meetings. So uh, we'd all meet up at the Globe up in Soho, which is a huge beer bar. Uh, Fridays, <laughs> the first Fridays of every, every month. So we're going to have one uh, this Friday, actually. It's going to be June soon. And um, yeah, so I met a lot of people in the industry, really enjoyed it. Um, and then last year, I decided to run for the board. Um, so I was vice president last year. And then it, this year, it was just very naturally, uh, I ran again for the board this year and was voted for president. So I mean, we're quite a small community still, but it is an honor to be president this year. Are they, did they vote for you because of your talent? Mm -hmm. Some people are going <laughs> to sort of want to question that and say, uh, was it talent or was it looks? <laughs> Well, how, backward, I mean, <laughs> how backward are people in Hong Kong? Oh, people in Hong Kong are fine. <laughs> like, I've never faced any real sort of sexual discrimination in the industry in Hong Kong so far. Uh, but then again, I've been here since, not the beginning, but I've been here since 2015, which is almost four years now. Uh, and so people in the industry do know me. And because we run the distribution side of our company, I also know most of the bar managers and the restauranteurs, and um, we're, we're a very good, friendly community. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think, I think um, it's just people who know what we've done. And last year, we did quite a good job, I would say, with the, with the association when I was vice president. And I think people just maybe want a more familiar face leading the association in the following years. Okay. Yeah. What, what kind of uh, duties does a president have to do? Besides um, having a big red button on the table to say, <laughs> more beer, please. Yeah. Um, what do we do? We plan the calendar, the, the major calendar for our association's members, corporate members. So this year we are doing a, our main event is we're doing a summer beer festival in July. Uh, so we're inviting eight local breweries and uh, it's going to be an anonymous beer festival similar to what they do sometimes in Scandinavia where basically there's no marketing on site involved. So you don't know the brewery of, you don't know the brewery of the beer you're drinking, but you do know the ABV and you do know the style. So each brewery is going to bring in two special beers. Uh, we don't, we, well, we as organizers know what they are, but consumers who come to the event won't know what they're drinking. They only know the style in ABV. Okay. And then, so they'll try a bunch of beers. There's going to be 16 in total. And then when they leave, they'll have a little, um, we'll be giving out little, uh, a little list of, you know, number one was this beer, number two was this beer. Because we want uh, people to be more experimental of what they're drinking. We don't want them to be blinded by misconceptions of like, oh, I don't want to try this brewery because they're new or you know, they're not as well known. So people will go in and without expectations and then hopefully they'll come out with a new favorite local beer. Okay, yeah. when you said anonymous, I'm glad you explained because I thought mm -hmm. typically when people go out for a drink anyway, everyone is anonymous by the end of the night. <laughs> <laughs> right now, bottling because canning lines are, from what I hear, I'm not a brewer, but from what I hear, canning equipment is quite expensive and it takes up a lot of room uh, and also there's a very silly public perception but you know it's obviously everyone thinks that oh cans are cheap we should totally bottle because you know it looks good on shelves blah 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 I think that perception is slowly changing we have um, two local breweries who have just started canning um, Young Masters Brewery just uh, I think they just installed their canning line and actually Heroes Beer Co, who is another, which is another local brewery founded last year, have always been canning. But they did it because they were contract, they were contract brewing. So they were allowed that, okay, contract brewing. <laughs> contract brewing basically means that um, it's 
a couple of brewers who want to start their own brewery, but they might not have the capital to invest in you know, building up a whole new place from scratch. So what they do is they go to an existing brewery and they say, hey, if you have a couple of tanks free, if you're not in full capacity, can we use this to brew our own beer and then bottle it or can it with our own labels, right? And so that's what Heroes Beer Co. in Hong Kong did last year. They uh, enlisted the help of Hitachino. Now, Hitachino Beer Co., the Japanese brewery of the Owl, it's quite, quite popular in Asia. So they have, a, they, have a, <laughs> they have a huge setup in Sha Tin up north. So yeah, the guys from Heroes were like, hey, we want to start a brewery, you know, if you guys want to get in on this. So they were able to can from the beginning is my point. <laughs> when I was a child, I was always told like, you shouldn't buy aluminium cans. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't buy a drink from an aluminium can, you should buy it from a steel can because aluminium cans can cause Alzheimer's. That okay. was when I was a child though. So fast yeah. forward 20 years later, are those concerns still here? Because last time we spoke, you were talking about techniques getting better and better. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're canning instead of bottling. Mm -hmm. is, yeah. there, is that something that you've come across? Um, I'm not an expert on like the whole aluminium steel debate, but for us mainly the main, I'm sorry, for us mainly the core reason for choosing cans over bottles is that Hong Kong real estate is extremely pricey and there's not so much fridge space in restaurants and bars. So cans are just like, sorry, <laughs> they're easier to recycle. Um, they're better for the environment in terms of like uh, getting rid of it because we don't, we don't recycle no, most Hong Kong of our bottles recycle. Hong Kong. Yeah, it's mm. really bad. So bottles there's so much waste. Um, and also the two, the two enemies of beer is light and oxygen, right? And while darker bottles do a good job in like protecting a beer, I would still say cans are superior because they are completely covered. Oh, I didn't bring any cans down there, still in the fridge. <laughs> She's got a fridge full of beer. <laughs> um, so and cans, it's only nine o'clock here in the morning. <laughs> But I haven't started drinking. Um, yeah, so cans are just a superior product in terms of like space conservation, recycling. Um, it's completely sealed, so there's no oxygen coming in, there's no light coming in. And um, in terms of transportation, they're also a more, they're an easier product to transport. You know, they're lighter, they're shorter, the cases are smaller. I mean, this, you could easily crack this open yeah. by accident, you know, and yeah, so. No one like cracks beer open by accident. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna take some listener questions. Yeah. Um, because there's quite a few. Uh, someone says I buy beer in glass bottles when I can. You also don't really get the can taste anymore. Yeah. Tasting cans versus bottle, we just talked about that. Mm -hmm. And what is considered a good beer? We, uh, personal preference in taste. So what do you enjoy as a beer? Uh, and then uh, do any brewers use local resources such as fresh water from the mountain, etc., etc. Okay. Um, for water, I think everyone filters and like adds their own, what is that, alkaline acid into okay. their water to, to make it taste harder or softer uh, to their preference. Uh, but we do have a lot of local breweries who use local ingredients, so with like goji berries or Hong Kong local honey or um, salted they make honey limes. In Hong Kong? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. we, have a, we have a huge um, bee farm up in. I want to say typo, but I'm not sure. Okay, if you have a contact, I'd be interested in speaking to Hong yeah. Kong beekeepers. Oh, cute. Authentic Chinese bee uh, honey. And yeah. um, there's, you know, PMQ, they had, before they had a yes. couple of stalls where they were selling local honey. Okay. I don't know if they're still there, but yeah, so it's pretty cool. I want to link it back to your role as a president, because mm -hmm. we didn't, I don't think everyone knows uh, about your duties, but because yeah. of the talking about resources, you were saying that one of the benefits of getting everybody on board is that you can uh, buy things wholesale yeah. as, a, as a large group. Mm -hmm. So you, yeah. you actually deal with logistics and mm -hmm. purchasing for, for beers as well. Um, yeah, so basically there's, a, there's, a, there's this thing called the Brewers Guild where all the brewers, well, most of the local breweries um, will get together once a month as well and they'll just talk about you know, uh, storage like warehouse space, uh, malts and hops imports and yeah you're totally right it's it makes it it makes so much more sense to consolidate everyone's orders especially if you're ordering from germany or from the us uh just to have everyone working together rather than doing small orders here and there and then you pay a premium because you're not really buying enough to make sense to import it um what would people order what yeah. would you order from the united states oh i don't order myself because i'm not well, a brewer but they order uh hops i assume 
Okay. Yeah. Any special <laughs> reason? Um, Is it just that Americans make better hops or something? Uh, they're in higher demand for sure. Uh, Australia makes, they grow hops as well. And I think China's market is slowly up and coming, but as everyone knows, there's always a bit of, um, I don't know, people are a bit skeptical about Chinese products. So. No, I mean, I was, um, I grew up in Hong Kong pretty much. I went to high school and university here. But after university, I followed love and um, I was dating a German boy. So I went to Germany with it and I went back to Germany with him. And I was there for two years. And um, that's when I really fell in love with beer. So I was in Germany from 2013 towards the mid 2015-ish, which is when I came back. Beer in Germany is pretty amazing because every um, different district, what do you call it a district? I don't know, a sub, they have like 13 different an area? I can't think of Oh, you mean like a county? Yeah, uh, sort of. Yeah, there's a German word for it, but I can't, yeah, can't think can't of it. I can't remember. Um, it's too early on a Monday. Uh, but yeah, so basically every you know county would have their own uh, special beer style. So, Or actually, within most cities as well, they have their own special beer styles. Like in Cologne, they have their Kolsch beer. And then in uh, Dusseldorf, they have Altbier. Uh, in Munich or in the Bavarian region, they're very famous for their wheat beer, so they have Weizens and Bradlers. <laughs> so, yeah, and I, I would travel around Germany and I was trying loads of different beers. And bear in mind, this is such a new world to me, considering I grew up drinking like Heineken and Carlsberg, and, uh, and that's what I thought beer was an occasional whole garden. And I thought, okay, this is beer. It's kind of gross, but everyone's drinking it, so I'll do it too. Yeah, but isn't Carlsberg supposed to be the best in the world? <laughs> Everyone will have their own opinions, and I won't hate anyone who says that. But, okay. You know. Um, yeah. No, so that's what, in Germany. That's why I fa that's where I fell in love with proper beer. You know, they have um, a very. I'm like losing all my vocabulary right now. Uh, but yeah, so they're they're very strict about their brewing. Um, beer is quite. They they have quite a purist idea of beer so uh, going back to what you said earlier they're like oh you know they only do you only drink local beer blah, blah blah so in germany they only allow four ingredients in beer and that's water hops small and yeast they don't they don't allow any sort of like um additions like special additions like in hong kong we'll throw in like salted lime or goji berries or maybe some raspberries to make a sour uh but in germany it's quite strict the laws on brewing so um yeah everything's very pure Okay. <laughs> um, but it was great because then I got to go to each of these different cities and got to try what um, each city's interpretation of a good beer or you know their beer style is and so that was pretty much the basis of how I fell in love with beer and how I learned about beer and then coming back to Hong Kong I so that was when there was maybe like two local breweries I was like oh my god the beer scene is very lacking and I think that was sort of the year that Loads of my friends, like my high school friends, my university friends, were also coming back from overseas. And coming back from overseas, from you just your world is so different because you're like, oh, I had such good beer just like from the local pub. Like, how is this not available in Hong Kong at all? And people were not very educated about craft beer here at that point. So that's when I joined my friend's craft beer and import uh, company because they were also just recently back in Hong Kong, they were like, we need to do something about it. So yeah, we started importing beer from Scotland, from Japan, from Australia, and yeah, good times. <laughs> oh, how much is one beer in bottle shops uh, or in supermarkets? They'll be between 30 to $50 a beer, Hong Kong dollars. Divided by eight for the US dollar. I'm Asian, but I'm bad at math, so I think that's like... So am I, so that's what <laughs> they can do it. <laughs> And then um, in pubs and bars and restaurants, I think it'll be around 80 to, okay, I'd say 70 to 100 for a pint. Okay. Yeah. It, it, happy hour is a bit cheaper, maybe around 50 to 70. Yeah. So it's, but that's for a good craft beer. Like uh, the generic, you know, the big boys, Heineken, Carlsberg, Blue Girl, Tingdal, they'll be cheaper. And uh, that really depends on the style of the beer you're drinking. So uh, we say definitely from like lagers up to IPAs, ambers, you should be drinking relatively cool. But then when it starts getting darker than that, like stouts and porters, uh, I would say let it 
leave it out for a while, the bottle, but don't open it yet. And just so it's not like completely ice cold, because that's when you really get the development of flavors. And in fact, uh, a, a huge like marketing scheme from, I mean, I'm not going to name names, but there's always like, oh, you know, you have to drink this beer ice cold, right? That's the way it's meant to be drunk. But they do it because as a commercial brewery, they cut a lot of corners when it comes to brewing and they use a lot of um, additives and preservatives to keep the beer uh, good longer. And when you drink a beer ice cold, you essentially don't taste anything, right? If you drink anything ice cold, you lose a lot of the flavor because it's just, you know, whatever. So. This is going to be really boring, but I mostly drink water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but basically, if you drink an ice cold beer versus a room temperature beer, the difference is worlds apart. So okay. all these, well, some of these uh, commercial breweries, they're like, drink this beer ice cold. And you drink it ice cold and it's like, it's okay, it's refreshing, it's cool, you know, you don't really taste much. But once you leave it out and it starts to get warm, you, you taste like a really distinct, like plastically, pa sorry, plasticky, like light skunky kind of taste. Oh. And that's because the beer is not a good beer. It's not a well-made beer. Uh, and that's why they ask you to drink it ice cold so, they, so that you don't taste it. But for craft beers, because everything's made with like real proper ingredients and they tend to not cut corners when it comes to how they brew, Drinking a beer and taking a while to drink it is perfectly fine because as it, as it warms up um, in your hand, uh, the flavors start developing and you really taste like a lot of undertones that you don't catch in the beginning when you first crack it open. And I would also say uh, you should always drink craft beer in a glass because um, when you drink it directly from a bottle, I mean, part of the experience is the aroma, right? And a lot of what you taste in general, you have to smell as well. So if you're just um, drinking from the bottle, you don't really get 100% of like what makes this beer so great. So um, yeah, definitely always pour a beer out, a craft beer, out in a glass so that you smell everything, you taste everything, you can appreciate the color, you know. Um, they have everything from pale ales to ambers to stouts. You really see like how rich and beautiful the beers are. I love beer. <laughs> <laughs> Monzen Brewery, did I say it right? Monzen? Monzen. Monzen Brewery, yeah. Brewery, and it says, we need to stop associating craft beer with certain social, socio-economical class. Yeah. What's that about? Because that's, that's, that's specific to Hong Kong, isn't it? Mm, mm, or isn't no, it? I think it's sort of worldwide. Um, the implication that like beer is only drunk by like construction workers or like, uh, I mean, even porters are named after quarters, you know, like the door boys and stuff in hotels back in the UK. Um, but yeah, so in Hong Kong, for sure, because beer is the cheapest alcoholic beverage um, in Hong Kong, they, there's just this, this like preconception that oh, beer is a cheap drink. And, but that's back when it was like commercial beers. Now beer is getting more expensive, especially if you buy like a, a good quality beer brewed in Hong Kong or even any of the imports. Uh, but yeah, so what, I think that was Laszlo's quote. He said, yeah, he, the, the, because definitely initially when they started out brewing, it was very hard for them to sell to local bars and restaurants because people are like, oh no, we, we don't, we, we're not a beer like restaurant. You know, we don't serve beer. It's, it's a very uppity attitude. Um, and which is crazy because beer is just as good. Well, personally, I think beer is just as good of a drink and it pairs just as well with food as wine or whiskey. And so um, we have loads of restaurants in Hong Kong who hire like multiple sommeliers and like um, they craft such lovely wine lists with like 50 to 100 different bottles in every restaurant. And then they come to beer and then it's just like Heineken or, right. you know, so. Like, why would you, you work so hard on this part, why would you just like <laughs> reduce your, an, another section of your drinks menu to... Right, so you're not really paying attention to that aspect mm -hmm. of serving yeah. customers who might be interested in beer. Yeah, exactly. and especially when, but then as we started getting more and more expats into Hong Kong, uh, then we started getting more and more demands, and that's when the bar managers really starting to listen, because people were like, why do you only have this one beer? Like, don't you have anything else available in Hong Kong? So that was part of why I wanted to start up the magazine. So um, we realized that it was, as an importer and distributor, it was really hard to sell because the, the bar staff weren't aware of the 
weren't aware of what good beer is and what bad beer is. You know, everyone's just putting all their money into educating their staff about wine, about whiskey, but beer is still very far behind. So that also jumps back to the first point. And so I started out Coaster Magazine with a couple of my friends. Um, so Coaster is Hong Kong and Macau's first and only bilingual beer magazine. And I um, definitely was really adamant that it had to be bilingual because I wanted everyone in the city to be able to pick it up and be able to read it. So this is English, traditional Chinese. Um, yeah, so this is, the aim of Coaster was also to educate, was mainly to educate the industry, but also, you know, the day-to-day -day person who comes into a bar or restaurant and wants to drink. So it's a free magazine and it was available in 150 different bars, restaurants, hotels across both cities. Um, we've since switched to an online only platform, but yeah, so we did this for a whole year, but we're a small, we're a small team and um, it was hard for us logistically. Uh, none of us did it full time. So it was always just like, it was a passion project and um, it's just easier to manage when everything's online now, even though I do love having a hard copy around. Mm. Yeah. The, but with regard to the, so the classi classicism mm -hmm. behind drinking beers, there was something else that I read in Coaster okay. where you was on a tipple trail and a tipple trail, you want to quickly explain what a tipple trail is? Yeah, okay, so a tipple trail is one of our sections of the magazine <coughs> where we basically choose a street and then we go to like three different places, three or four different places, pubs or restaurants, I mean, and we have a drink and we get some snacks and uh, I basically do a mini review of the place. Sorry, yeah. And well, what, I was, what I read in one part of another, one issue of a magazine was that someone said you have to change the perception so that people pay more than $40 for a beer. Mm -hmm. But then on one of, on your, one of your tipple, tra tipple trails, mm -hmm. um, you have to pay $82 for each bottle of beer. Mm -hmm. And the sort of tone from the mini review was that that was not a good price. Mm -hmm. And so it left me sort of wondering, well, what is a good price for a craft beer mm -hmm. in Hong Kong? Because you have, you have a, you have someone who, who's a restaurant owner yeah. saying you have to pay more than $40, but you're saying $80 is too much. Mm -hmm. So what's the, what is the natural equilibrium for a good craft beer? Um, I don't really want to throw a number out because I feel like every brewery and every importer will have their own reasons for putting the beers at a certain price. Um, there are people who would happily pay $90, $100 for a beer without issue. For me personally, so I wrote that bit about how 82 is too expensive for a bottle because I know how much bottles cost coming in. <clears throat> oh, sorry. And, um, $80, by the way, is 10 US. <clears throat> 80 Hong Kong dollars is 10 US. Yeah, and so for me personally, when I go to uh, bars and restaurants, I try to only, I try to look at the draft menu first because everything from tap is, is better, in my opinion. So it's <laughs> for my personal preference, I like drinking, you know, from the tap and then cans and bottles, okay. basically. Um, yeah, so 82, now I think it's become normalized to pay like $80 for a pint. Um, but $80 for a bottle, I still think it's a bit of a, <coughs> it's a bit pricey. But at the same time, if, you, if, you, if the issue is the perception of like, it's a class thing, don't mm -hmm. you think 10 US dollars for a, for a <coughs> pint or even a bottle is quite a lot. You can get a meal, probably get two meals for, mm -hmm for 10 US, 80 Hong Kong dollars. Yeah. That's, that's the only thing. <laughs> Missed your question. <laughs> My question was, with this price perception, um, and $80 is too much, but then the other person in the magazine is saying you need to pay more than $40, mm -hmm. that's still a lot of money. And not everybody is going to be able to cough up yeah. that much money, especially when, contrast, contrast that with the class issue, like it's yeah. gonna put itself out of most people's price range, especially mm -hmm. when, say if you're working in Welcome or working in Mannings, you're probably getting $40 an hour. Mm -hmm. So you have to work two hours for a, for a bottle of beer. Mm -hmm. um, well, what we want, I think we want beer to be inclusive, but we also don't want it to be seen. I think we're, we're looking at it from two different perspectives. Okay. From what That's I fine. took off that quote was that, Laszlo thinks that we shouldn't associate beer with the lower class, as in it, we shouldn't always associate it with like, uh, people shouldn't look down on beer, basically. Okay. And like, uh, look at a glass of wine in a restaurant. People would happily pay $100 for a glass of wine, which is, you know, quite a lot, right? And for beer, you get more volume for that same amount. 
and it's just as good, if not better. <laughs> uh, I don't know where I'm going with this. Uh, I just feel like it has been, the, the culture has been changing in Hong Kong and people are starting to see, especially more and more local breweries with local brewers, uh, spreading the message about good beer. That has helped push that perception that beer is not just a cheap drink, basically. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> uh, well, my other question was, how do you get people to pay more? I think just um, education, like understanding that good beer is made with good ingredients, good malts, good hops, water, yeast, um, real estate in Hong Kong is expensive, you know, brewers, yeah, they are very passionate about what they do, they're very good at what they do here, and it's just a, I think, I think it'll happen in time, that people will start to understand that it's okay to pay $70, $80 for beer because this is a genuinely good product. Okay, but if they do, then they might just treat it as a as a treat, like a once 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 a week, once a month, or mm -hmm. something, rather than like because the the appeal of ting ting dao ting mm -hmm. tao mm -hmm. is that it's so much cheaper, but it's so much more common. You see people on the on the streets drinking. I know I'm comparing mm -hmm. it to like one of the lower priced beers, mm -hmm. but it is it's everywhere. Yeah, I think, and, I think it really depends on the person, like. Even uh, wine drinkers, like, they really only drink once a week or once a month, right? What is that word? It um, starts with an I, I think. Um, the, like the fish sacks, the stomachs. They use it to filter beer. Um, okay. The I buoyancy bladder. I think so. Is it the buoyancy bladder? I, there's a word for it, and I should know this, but it's Monday morning, and I, I haven't had a beer. Uh, yeah, it's like a fish, I think it's fish bladder. Like, they use it to, to filter beer. But um, there are vegan beers where they just use, like, a... Um, what do you call it? Like one of those clotting agents, and they stir it in, and it grabs all the. Is the it really a beer, though? If it's, if it's a vegan beer. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it depends. There are some good ones in the market. I think from America. I don't know if we. Of have course, one from in America. Kong. I don't think Chinese people are going to make <laughs> vegan beer. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so yeah, there is there are, there are um, there is some fish products used when it comes to brewing, for sure. Okay, but that's just for filtration purposes, yeah. not actual pieces of fish. Yeah, you, you won't taste it in a beer. But yeah, and then moving on to untapped. <laughs> I think I did use those words, Tinder for beer. It's uh, Untapped is basically, it's more like Instagram for beer. So you can uh, take a photo of your beer, you can check it in, uh, mm. check into it, write a comment, give a rating, tasting notes, and then you can like add people on it as well. Uh, yeah, it's great. I use Untapped quite a bit. My username is at Yumzel, Y-U-M-Z-A-U, if anyone wants Only to add Only the Chinese me. viewers are going to add you because, <laughs> say it again. Yumzel. So Yumzel is, um, it basically means drink alcohol in Cantonese and that's my social media handle for basically everything. Okay, I can put that on the YouTube channel, but I can't, I can't okay. do anything on the live. That's fine, that's fine. Um, yeah, so for Untapped, you can, so I've added, um, I have a lot of friends from overseas and it's good to see what they're drinking, what they recommend. Um, and then you can also check out, there's also like a, a map function where you can check out um, nearby bars and restaurants that serve beer that's highly rated, basically. So it's a very nifty little app. Uh, I do enjoy using it. Untapped. Yeah. Okay, that's untapped, but there's no E in the past tense when it's, uh, when it, uh, as it's written. Yeah, it's just U-N-T-A-P-P-D. Just like Tinder has no E. <laughs> it doesn't? Oh, okay. I've never used it. it. Oh, I'm thinking of Grinder. Yeah, I'm thinking of Grinder. <laughs> Sorry, I'm confused with Tinder. Clearly, okay. I think it's just. To be honest, I don't think it's anything like cultural. I think it's more um, based on money and how much effort it takes to set up a huge beer tent. So our Oktoberfest is not a proper Oktoberfest, of course. It's just held at the Marco Polo Hotel every year. Um, and For a they, month. Yeah. <laughs> The Marco Polo German Beer Fest is, they invite the Notenhobler oh, every, every year. They're a very famous um, German music group and they really pump up the crowd. They, they wear Lederhosen and Dandels and it's very, uh, uh, very authentic. We drink Polana um, or whoever's sponsoring them this year. And it's great fun. It's great fun. I'm, so yeah, I think it's just, because it just logistically, it takes so much time and effort and cost to set it up. So why not do it for as long as you can? 
It's a great attitude, I guess, if, <laughs> if, if you're a passionate beer drinker. Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, it's always great fun. We have several beer festivals every year, like Beertopia, which used to be Hong Kong's only craft beer festival, but now we have more and more coming up. We just had one from um, that was organized by our, a local brewery, Young Master Brewery. So they uh, started an invitational beer festival where they invited different local breweries from across Asia to participate as well. So it was, uh, from what I hear, it was very successful. Uh, it was only yesterday and the day before, but I was dragon boating, so I couldn't. And how do you it. participate in, in Oktoberfest or these events? What do you do? Uh, we usually have a booth at Beertopia, but I think this year we're not going to be doing it. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, there's a bit of drama going on in okay. there. Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I think generally for sure, cause, because um, even a lot of my own friends, they're like, oh, beer would make me fat. It's like pure carbs. And then they're sipping on like, I don't know, a pina colada, which is probably more calories than a beer, you know? So but a lot of food in Hong Kong is mostly carbs. Yeah, anyway, that's all true. All the pastry shops, <laughs> noodles, rice, it's all carbs. So. Yeah, I mean, but that's, that's, that's why it's great to have a female uh, and the head of the Craft Beer Association. It brings, uh, hopefully it makes beer more approachable to women. And uh, speaking of that, I don't think I told you this, but uh, we also, I also co, I'm a co-leader of the Pink Boots Society in Hong Kong, which we started out last year. So Pink Boots Society is um, founded by um, this woman named Terry from the US around 10 years ago. It's a, um, a nonprofit organization that aims to support, encourage, and inspire uh, women in the beer industry. So you're allowed to join if you make a working salary from working in beer, no matter what section, right? And um, so I co-founded this with my girlfriend Marissa last year. She is the wife and uh, co-founder as well of uh, Back to School Brewing in Lychee Cock. So yeah, she's great. Um, and every year we do a collaboration brew this year. We brewed a bright ale, which was very well received by a lot of women, and so we're really happy about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just, to, I just want to back up a tiny little smidge. Yeah. Uh, you're saying that friends, your female friends, don't want to drink beer because Some of them, because yeah. it's they're going to get heavy. Mm -hmm. Now, you as the president, and you as someone who's a woman and drinking beer, do they not look at you and say, "Well, Sandra's not fat." And I don't mean to talk about your yeah. body because mm -hmm. you're a woman and everything, but I think mm -hmm. it's we're kind of on that topic, so we might yeah. as well explore it a bit. But surely they can look at you and say, well, Sanja has no problems. I remember mm -hmm. when I interviewed the owner of Happy Cow Ice Cream, mm -hmm. and he was saying, yeah, I've, I, I've gained loads of weight testing, testing product, mm -hmm. testing the product uh, of this vegan ice cream. And yeah. he, he felt like he was suffering, whereas, okay. whereas in our conversations, you know, we haven't talked about your... I hesitate to say, we haven't talked about your body, and uh -huh. that's probably because it hasn't been an issue for you. Right. And yeah. so, if it hasn't been an issue for you, surely some of that has to be communicated to other women to say, mm -hmm. well, it's not a problem. Yeah. You know, and as you said, it's, it's in Hong Kong food, carbs. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it, save oh. me from that line of question, please. <laughs> no, but that's why I think it's a very like um, false and inherent perception that we need to sort of eradicate, right? Um, if you if you eat too much or if you drink too much of anything, it will always cause like a detrimental effect, right? It's always everything in moderation. So I drink quite a bit, but then uh, I also drink a lot of water, and I also enjoy like walking around the city. And a real beer purist would say there's water in beer. <laughs> of course. Of course. <coughs> um, no, yeah, that's a you you do make a good point. I think. Um, Especially now thinking about it, all the women that I know in the industry are relatively slim as well. So that's why it's good to get more exposure for women in beer. And hence, Pink Boots Society, which is you know, our second year now. Uh, we, we are quite small. We only have 15 paid members, but we are a small industry still. So hopefully that number goes up as the years trudge slowly by. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, I definitely think that if women are okay to drink cocktails, very sweet, syrupy cocktails, then you can drink beer as well. And it's not gonna, it's not gonna make you fat if you don't drink five pints a day. Yeah. You are living proof. I think, <laughs> do you remember from Cartman? Cartman uh, had the weight gain 4,000. Are you talking about South Park? South Park, yeah. And he's like, 
follow your dreams, you yeah. will succeed. And he's like, just really fat because he's so delusional. Okay. Do you remember? And he's like, I am living proof. He's just quaffing when he gained 4,000. I watch South Park like now and then, so I don't really know. <laughs> it's really know. old ones, it's really okay. old ones. Okay, it might be before my time. <laughs> but you're saying like, you will succeed, you can be like me. Uh-huh. And I'm feeling, I'm getting those feels from you. Like, you can be like me. <laughs> You haven't okay. suffered, just Pretty like fair. Carmen hasn't, hasn't suffered. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thank you for trusting me with uh, that line of questioning about uh, body perceptions. Yeah. Well, I feel like if they like amusement parks and roller coasters, which I do, they should definitely visit Ocean Park. Ocean Park is um, it's not only an amusement park, though. They've sort of combined it as, with a marine life. A sea life center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can see, dol- you can see and play with dolphins. And um, I, I, what, I can't think of any more. Uh, yeah, dolphins. Sharks. <laughs> Jellyfish. Fish. Um, yeah. And then there's monkeys. We also have our pandas are there. Yes, there so are pandas. There's a panda enclosure. They don't swim though. No. <laughs> they don't eat with the sharks. And they just sit there and they eat bamboo and they sleep. Uh, we also have an Arctic fox enclosure and they're so cute. They're, they look like Eevees, but they're white and I love Eevees. They're my favorite Pokemon. And that okay. <laughs> and then, uh, I don't know if you know what Eevees are. No, okay. I, I've never watched Pokemon. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hiking in Hong Kong is really great. Uh, Dragon's Back is an easy hike uh, that you can do. I think it only takes like, two hours and you get really amazing views of the shore and a couple of um, islands, out- outlying islands as well. Visiting um, outlying islands, sorry, can't talk. Outla- outer lying islands are also great. Lama Islands, Cheng Jiao. That's, That's one of the actual hidden sort of gems about Hong Kong. People expect a huge city, and it is mm. kind of huge in a sense like it's so dense and it feels, you know, like a burden sometimes yeah. to walk around, but then they don't realize like there, are, there is so much nature here, and so yeah. much hiking to be had. I think like 70 to 80% mm. of Hong Kong is nature, which is kind of crazy because whenever you look at photos of Hong Kong, it's just like our skyline, which is our city line, which yeah. is amazing, you know, from Tsim Sa Tso, you're from Central. Uh, oh, Gork, the peak, that's a very popular tourist location. Um, <laughs> Sorry, my contact is giving me. <laughs> so I think that's my list. And then if it's for beer, then I have a whole other list. <laughs> <laughs> Go on then, what's the beer list? Oh, well, uh, definitely visit the Globe, um, which is one of the oldest beer bars in Hong Kong. Where uh, is that? Soho, it's up on Graham Street. Okay. Um, and then visit Second Draft, which I personally think is one of our most sophisticated beer bars. They have three different temperature settings for uh, their beer based on if it's a lager, it's much colder, and then the porters and stouts, oh, they're okay. a little bit warmer. Uh, and then they also have a hand pump for real ales. This is not an ad, but um, these are just the beers that I really these like. These were just props, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> we just wanted to have some beers around. So these two are from Black Isle Brewery in Inverness up in Scotland. So they are a purely organic brewery and I love them because they do a closed loop, si- closed loop system so they um, they have a cow they have, well there's several cows maybe a whole farm of cows and they use the cow poop as fertilizer and they grow their own um, I think hops and malts they use pure water from the highlands so it's very very Scottish and amazing um, and then they use the spent grain to feed the cows uh, and even the even the Labels are made of recycled paper, so yeah. So this is the Golden Eye Pale Ale, which won um, Best Beer in Hong Kong two years in a row. And then this is this this is their Scotch Ale, which I love and actually kind of made me fall in love with beer. So Scotch Ale is very deep and heavy, and it tastes like liquid fruit cake. But I, don't, I have a sweet tooth, so I really love this. Um, and just quickly going through the other two, someone asked about American beers. Yeah, they do well in Hong Kong for sure. So this is from Anchor Brewery. We have the Steam and then their Liberty Ale. So for those who don't know, the Liberty Ale, well, Anchor Brewery was the first brewery that went back into production after the prohibition. And the Liberty Ale was the first beer that was brewed, hence the name Liberty. So, and then the last two are just- So it's very patriotic, it more is than any other American beer. I think so. <laughs> okay, so if you're a purist... <laughs> Drink the Liberty Ale yeah. from Anchor Brewing. Be a purist and a patriotic First yeah. Amendment, Second Amendment, all the amendment purists. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then the last couple of bottles I have on the table is from a very new um, Singaporean brewery called Brewlander. Um, their brewer, John, is quite emotional, hence all the, <laughs> all the names are named after emotion. So this is hope, this is love. That he has courage and uh, respect. Um, but I love this one. Love is a wild IPA. I don't know if you can see. The labels are so cute. And I love them because they use white labels. 
and white labels really stand out. I don't know why um, most breweries stick to like black labels because white labels look really cool. <laughs> um, where can people uh, find you on the internet? On the internet, um, we at oh. Coaster. Oh, at Coaster Mag. Coaster That's Mag. Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> and your website for the magazine? CoasterMag.com. Yeah, and then also if you want to check out the Craft Beer Association, that's just cbahk.org. Yeah, so we cover basically um, local news, but we also branch out into Asian news. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so we try to be more local centric. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to know what's happening in Hong Kong, um, yeah, that's, that's where I would go. Okay. So. I would not make a big, uh, good beer judge because I, d I don't like the taste of beer. Oh my god, Sorry. this kind of looks like you, actually. I just realized. <laughs> Which half? <laughs> Doesn't it look like you? <laughs> we got to get closer. That was, this is me when I was 23. <laughs> this is me now. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay. uh, so that's James Watt from um, BrewDog in Scotland. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. <famous. laughs> thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, having me. This has me. been really fun. Yeah. Thank, uh, you. thank you for trusting me with some of the topics. Because yeah. we only met like we met on Reddit, and I did a call out for anybody who wanted to do anything interesting uh, with regard to uh, a podcast. And you actually announced yourself and said, "I'm the president." <laughs> Huge <laughs> amount of commas <laughs> of the Craft Beer Association, yeah. and I would love to be on the show. <laughs> and I Caught love my it. attention, the president. What? I'm always on Reddit. Yeah, okay, cool.